Phew, you guys made it through the lectures on cranial nerves and you're still coming back and listening to me. So congratulations on your resilience and grit. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about uh, the basal ganglia, uh, lecture 6-2. The basal ganglia is kind of a misnomer because uh, as you may have figured out by now, ganglia are locations of neural cell bodies outside in the periphery, outside the central nervous system. So the correct name for this structure would be the basal nuclei because the structures we're gonna be talking about today are deep within the uh, prosencephalon. Uh, but the name basal ganglia has stuck since time immemorial, so uh, you'll hear people using that uh, continuously. The basal ganglia itself is involved in the initiation of efferent processes from the cortex. So we've learned about the uh, ascending systems, how sensory information gets to the post-central uh, gyrus. We've learned about how motor activity is initiated in the precentral gyrus in the supplementary motor area, uh, or, or actually where that, the upper motor neurons are, is in those gyri. Um, but how do we connect these two processes? How do we connect the afferent systems so that we can respond to uh, using efferent output uh, our environment around us. And that's something that the basal ganglia helps to do. So the basal ganglia is the part that's initiating motor output. The motor output is programmed by the, uh, the um, supplementary motor area, and then that sequence is outputted to the uh, precentral gyrus, but the basal ganglia deep in the prosencephalon is saying when to release that motor output. So first let's talk about the functionality. What's included in the basal ganglia or basal nuclei? What do we, uh, what do we include in this overarching term? And the first of these things we'll talk about is the striatum. The striatum has four different uh, nuclei within it. And typically we talk about regions of the striatum, the dorsal versus the ventral striatum. The dorsal striatum is more involved in uh, cognitive processes and motor output. So the caudate nucleus in the dorsal striatum is the cognitive uh, output processor of uh, the basal ganglia, whereas the putamen is involved in voluntary uh, sensory motor processes, motor output. You can see uh, those two different regions in the dorsal striatum highlighted here. We have the caudate uh, more medially and upon the border of the lateral ventricle, the lateral border of the lateral ventricle. <clears throat> Separated by the internal capsule from the caudate is the putamen. Next, uh, we'll move down to the ventral striatum. The ventral striatum contains the nucleus accumbens. Nucleus accumbens is all about drive and motivation, reward. Uh, so it's, it's considered a limbic function and it will output uh, into limbic areas, uh, ultimately. <clears throat> the olfactory tubercle is also considered here uh, more ventral from the, uh, the nucleus accumbens, is also considered part of the striatum, and it's involved in um, integrating information, especially olfactory information, and memory and emotion, these kind of limbic uh, functions. Uh, in order to inform the ultimate processes involved. So now let's go uh, farther posterior, more caudally in the brain. Uh, we can see that uh, the, lin uh, the lintiform nuclei are beginning to differentiate from the putamen. We now have the globus pallidus, uh, which is the second portion of the basal ganglia we'll be talking about. So the globus pallidus itself is separated into two different nuclei, the external and the internal segments. And both of these are inhibitory uh, neurons. Uh, so their projection that they send out to their target neuron, uh, so that inhibits the target of the GPE and GPI. Uh, moving on even more uh, caudally, we can now see uh, the last two portions of the basal ganglia. We have here the substantia nigra and the subthalamic nucleus. Substantia nigra uh, has two different nuclei within it. Mainly when we talk about the substantia nigra, we talk about the dopaminergic neurons. Uh, 
of the substantia nigra. Those neurons are located uh, within a small portion of the substantia nigra called the pars compacta, which is kind of more <clears throat> dorsal uh, and uh, more superior than the other segment, which is the uh, substantia nigra uh, pars reticulata, which is an inhibitory projection. Uh, and the SNR functions very closely with the GPI. So if something's targeting the GPI, it's most likely targeting and bleeding into the SNR as well. Uh, so we kind of lump those together when we talk about the circuits of the basal ganglia. Uh, subthalamic nucleus is going to be an excitatory nucleus. So now let's look at these from a different point of view. Uh, so this is going to be our axial view from a top down. So the front of the brain is uh, up, the back of the brain, the occipital portion of the brain is down in this view. We can see the caudate nucleus here um, on the uh, lateral border of the lateral ventricles. <clears throat> and we can see that uh, if we put these together in our mind, the caudate nucleus is actually a C shape uh, that covers the wall, that lateral wall uh, of the lateral ventricle. The putamen separated by the anterior limb of the internal capsule. The thalamus behind that, the thalamus not part of the basal nuclei, that's its own separate thing. And here you can see the tail of the caudate in the posterior portion of the lateral ventricles. <coughs> mm, excuse me. As we move more inferiorly, then we can begin to see how these, uh, the globus pallidus starts to appear uh, nestled within the putamen. And in the midbrain, the mesencephalon, we can see the substantia nigra itself. Here is a lateral view of these structures. Uh, again, just showing the relationship now between the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra. Uh, we can also see the entire C shape of the caudate from this view, uh, as well as the putamen and the uh, portions of the globus pallidus. So, the um, substantia nigra is the most critical component of this basal nuclei circuitry uh, because it is the dopaminergic center of the central nervous system. <coughs> basically, uh, COVID-19, sorry. Uh, so basically, all of the, uh, the dopamine that's produced in the brain is produced in the midbrain within the subthalamic nucleus and a closely uh, related nucleus, the VTA, ventral tegmental area nucleus. These areas are too small to see on imaging, but the other portions of the basal ganglia we can see uh, with imaging. So this is uh, MRI of the brain. <clears throat> you can see here now highlighting these different portions, the thalamus, the lateral ventricle, the caudate nucleus along that wall that we can see the C shape, clearly from the lateral view, uh, from the coronal view, we can see the internal capsule separating the caudate and the putamen, and the axial view there, seeing all three. Uh, so in this way, you can see many of these components of the basal ganglia, and you can detect things like uh, a stroke in the lenticulostriate uh, arteries, which would impact the caudate nucleus, the internal capsule, the putamen to varying degrees. So uh, imaging is an important way to uh, diagnose certain conditions, to differentially diagnose things like stroke from Parkinson's or Huntington's uh, or uh, hemibolism, which we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, but there are also some telltale uh, symptoms and signs that we'll talk about for each of these as well. <clears throat> so now we understand the nuclei and where they're located. Let's talk about how they're connected. So this is the circuitry of the basal ganglia. Uh, this is the complete circuitry showing all of the patterns um, of, of innervation, what uh, effect each nucleus has on its target and where those targets are. So starting in the center, we have the dopaminergic substantia nigra pars compacta. And so it's labeled in blue here. The uh, substantia nigra, uh, sends its projections to the dorsal striatum, to the putamen, uh, where it arborizes with two populations of neurons within the striatum. These are called D1 and D2 populations of neurons. Uh, 
These neurons uh, are so named because they contain the D1 family of receptors or the D2 family of receptors. Now the D1 family of receptors are stimulated by dopamine. So their receptor sitting there on the cell membrane and it has a, a, a you know, a whatever activating, uh, causing an action potential in the target neuron. So when dopamine binds to a D1 family of neuron with a D1 receptor, that target neuron is activated, it's stimulated, it's action, it fires an action potential. <clears throat> However, when dopamine land or, or uh, um, synapses releases its neurotransmitter, when the substantia nigra re releases dopamine in the synapse on a D2 receptor family neuron, that D2 receptor family neuron inhibits the, that target neuron. So an action potential is not triggered in that target neuron by dopamine. So in this way, uh, a neurotransmitter can be unchanged, but it can activate or inhibit uh, different populations of targets. And so the dorsal striatum has these two different populations of targets. The D1 population of neurons is part of the direct pathway. It's called the direct pathway because it directly, uh, it has projections directly to the GPI, the globus pallidus internus. The D2 population of neurons are part of the indirect pathway because it takes multiple steps before that pathway ends up also on the GPI. So we can see that uh, when the D1 family of neurons is activated, it releases inhibitory, a neurotransmitter on the GPI. So when the direct pathway is activated, GPI is inhibited. When the indirect pathway is activated, we see that, that those D2 neurons inhibit the GPE. Now the GP is inhibited, so it's not firing its inhibitory projections. So that means the subthalamic nucleus is no longer being inhibited. It's being uh, disinhibited. So STN can now uh, you know, release excitatory neurotransmitter onto the GPI and activate the uh, GPI. So when the indirect pathway is receiving dopamine, that causes the GPI to be activated. So the purpose here is this dorsal striatum is balancing the dopaminergic signals and figuring out, uh, synthesizing that information onto the GPI. That GPI will synthesize the activity of these two pathways and based on the balance there, uh, the GPI will either be uh, activated or inhibited. The GPI inhibits the VA of the thalamus the VA is responsible for outputting motor movement to the motor cortex. So if the GPI is activated, it, the GPI then inhibits the VA of the thalamus. So the VA of the thalamus can no longer uh, excite the motor cortex. So uh, in that way, motor output is inhibited through the indirect pathway. So. Now that we've talked about all that convoluted pathways, inhibition and excitation, let's look at, let's change this pathway and highlight, uh, show you what actual pathways are activated in a normal individual who's uh, producing motor output. So with the uh, substantia nigra releasing dopamine into the putamen, that causes the uh, inhibition of the indirect pathway and the excitation of the direct pathway. When the direct pathway is inhibiting the GPI, when it's activated, it inhibits the GPI and that disinhibits the VA of the thalamus. So when the GPI is not inhibiting the VA of the thalamus, the VA of the thalamus is constitutively active and it's telling the motor cortex, okay, release motor output, do, do whatever it is you're thinking about. And so the VA is exciting the motor cortex. Motor cortex is sending those upper motor neuron projections down the spinal cord through the corticospinal tract to a lower motor neuron causing uh, motor output to occur. So this is the normal individual. This is a functioning substantia nigra 
with uh, a disinhibited motor output is what we call it. The motor output has been disinhibited because normally it's inhibited. Now, let's take a look at what can go wrong in this pathway. For instance, if the substantia nigra is degenerated as it does, uh, as it occurs in Parkinson's disease. So in Parkinson's disease, the primary problem is a degeneration of the substantia nigra. So dopamine is no longer released into the putamen, which means the indirect pathway is no longer being inhibited. The indirect pathway results uh, in, so this uh, activity results in stimulation of the GPI, resulting in inhibition of the VA. Because the VA is inhibited, the motor cortex can no longer be stimulated sufficiently to produce to initiate motor output. So in that way, uh, we get the primary uh, signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which is uh, uh, rigidity of the uh, peripheral muscles, which is postural instability as a result of that rigidity, uh, slowness of movement called bradykinesia. Uh, and um, uh, cogwheel rigidity, as well as a tremor, a resting tremor in the arms. So that resting tremor is very characteristic. It occurs at about a four to six hertz frequency, uh, and it's a very complicated thing. It's thought to be the result of feedback from the cortex to the striatum, uh, causing this uh, very rhythmic uh, tremor during rest. Not during intention. When a, when a Parkinsonian patient, uh, you ask them to point to something or hold their hand out, their tremor will go away because they are intentionally moving their muscles. But when they're not intentionally moving their muscles, that feedback takes over and they get this resting tremor. So that's Parkinson's disease. Uh, Parkinson's disease was characterized all the way back in 1817 by James Parkinson. Uh, and it features those, uh, those primary motor symptoms I talked about, the uh, tremor, rigidity, postural instability, and bradykinesia. As it progresses, you get to a state of akinesia where the patient can no longer move of their own volition. Um, um, what else to say? So, um, okay, so Parkinson's disease is important because it is... Uh, probably the, the most prevalent and impactful neurodegenerative disease uh, in the United States. Uh, it's estimated that over one and a half million people in the United States are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease uh, and that the cost to our economy nationwide uh, is uh, about $5.6 billion according to the NINDS and that measurement was taken about 10 years ago. So more recent cost as estimates range as high as $23 billion. And so those costs include um, the pharmaceutical costs uh, as well as other things. So because of the uh, age at which Parkinson's disease affects people, it usually, the average age at which a person is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease is 65 years of age. So that is pre-retirement age. So because of this condition, uh, individuals with the condition have to cut back on their working hours or quit work or retire early. So the cost also includes this loss of wages. It includes in the later stages of the disease the care that has to be given to these patients, whether in a nursing home, a skilled uh, care facility, um, or, or um, you know, any other number of things, including loved ones having to cut back on their uh, working time to care for uh, their Parkinsonian uh, family member. So <clears throat> the cost uh, is quite high. It's, it's a, a very important disease and because we know a bit about it, uh, there are a number of therapies that have been devised to uh, help individuals with the disease. So let's take a look at the neuropathology involved. So of course we have a, a mid-sagittal cross-section of the brain in this view and I'm going to make two cuts through this brain, one at line A and one at line B. When we do that, we can see these two different uh, cross sections from the brains and uh, each image has uh, an example from a normal Parkinsonian patient, a normal individual and one from a Parkinsonian patient. So we can see here uh, in the pain one through the mesencephalon, we can see the substantia nigra uh, within these sections. We can see in the left section here, 
the substantia nigra uh, clearly visible by this uh, dark stain uh, within. So uh, this darkness to the substantia nigra is caused by the production of uh, neuromelanin. It's naturally produced as a byproduct of dopamine synthesis. So when dopamine is being synthesized, neuromelanin is also being produced. Uh, here we see in this other section, uh, the substantia nigra is not so clear. Uh, there is not the neuromelanin content as in the other example. And so uh, we're imagining now that this patient has a severe deficit in uh, neurotransmitter levels. So now we're taking a section through the uh, pawns of the brainstem, we can see uh, near the, um, the uh, aqueduct, the uh, cerebral aqueduct, the periaqueductal uh, structures around it, and we can see a very dark region near that. Uh, that dark region is called the locus ceruleus, the blue spot. The blue, so locus ceruleus produces norepinephrine, and norepinephrine uh, the precursor to norepinephrine is dopamine. Dopamine has to be produced to make norepinephrine. Uh, so neuromelanin is also produced in the locus ceruleus. And we can see here in the left section a very dark spot, the locus ceruleus, where that neuromelanin and the dopamine and its subsequent norepinephrine are being produced. And in the other side, we see those dark spots are much smaller. So in, in Parkinson's disease, uh, these uh, catecholaminergic uh, nuclei are being degenerated. So the dopamine is being degenerated. There are also secondary symptoms in Parkinson's disease, including insomnia, uh, fecal and urinary incontinence, uh, cognitive decline, and that can be attributed to the decline in the norepinephrine that's being produced, as well as some other features where dopamine is important as well. So that's what we see neuropathologically in Parkinsonian patients. And as you guessed, the normal patient is on the left, Parkinsonian one is on the right, or if you read my slides, I think it, you know, it's not animated in my slides, so you already know. Uh, so there are treatments for Parkinson's disease. These are mostly palliative in nature. So these are called carbidopa. Carbidopa uh, is actually L-dopa, the precursor to the natural synthesis of dopamine. So the idea with L-dopa, or carbidopa, is to give the remaining substantia nigra neurons a uh, sure supply, a sure fit of precursors so that they can produce as much dopamine as they're capable of producing. So this helps in the early stages. Uh, now when the substantia nigra neurons begin to degenerate uh, more fully, the symptoms uh, become greater, then typically we add on monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Monoamine oxidase breaks down dopamine after it's been released in the synapse. So by inhibiting those, the uh, neurons can take dopamine back up in a greater quantity, repackage them, and just re-release them again. So, uh, you know, first we're uh, reducing, now we're reusing or recycling or whatever. Um, now, finally, apomorphine is a direct analog for dopamine, um, but um, it has its drawbacks. So it can, it can function in the striatum when no dopamine is left from the substantia nigra. But the drawbacks are the side effects and the short-lived effect of apomorphine. Apo an injection of apomorphine may only have an effect over uh, 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, and then the symptoms return because it is, you know, uh, broken down and flushed from the brain very quickly. So the uh, alternative there is surgical implantation of a catheter and a micro pump uh, within the individual. So in so doing, uh, neurosurgery is performed, a burr hole is formed in the cranium, uh, and a catheter is implanted down using MRI-guided uh, stereotactic uh, processes to precisely place this catheter or an electrode potentially into the appropriate nucleus. So with apomorphine that might be the striatum. Um, with the electrodes, the idea of implanting an electrode is to adjust the balance between the direct and the indirect pathways. So by stimulating or inhibiting different pathways in the basal ganglia circuitry with an electrode and a little battery pack, um, then that electrode can uh, alter that balance and, and reduce the symptoms uh, 
of Parkinson's disease. Um, <clears throat> so um, those are uh, the main treatments. Of course, with the surgical treatments, uh, you get uh, you get the the uh, the the uh, concurrent um, side effects and risks of intracranial surgery. So these surgeries are usually done in late stage patients uh, who have are done responding to the other uh, potential therapies. And of course, these late stage patients are older individuals less able to recover from a surgery and we're performing uh, you know the most invasive surgery on them implanting a foreign body so there are um, side effects including infection including intracranial hemorrhage including a uh, lack of recovery even death uh, so um, those surgeries are reserved for late stage patients uh, for for many of those reasons now, Huntington's disease is another uh, disease uh, that's, uh, that affects the basal ganglia. In Huntington's disease, you get the exact opposite. You get jerky, uncontrolled movements. Uh, so your, your basal ganglia is always causing movements uh, because of the impairment uh, specific to Huntington's disease. Uh, so as Huntington's disease progresses, it develops into cognitive uh, effects as well, and we'll see why. Huntington's disease is a genetic condition, specifically within the Huntington gene caused by a poly-Q repeat, a CAG uh, 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 DNA sequence repeat uh, within the Huntington gene. As that repeat expands and expands due to replication errors, in DNA replication, then um, that results in misfolding of this important Huntington protein. That misfolding leads to degeneration of, uh, we see here, the striatum. So there are treatments for Huntington's disease, uh, mostly neuroepileptics, but physical therapy is also important because it can uh, help uh, maintain control of muscles uh, for a longer period of time, as well as the importance of educating these individuals as to the progression of the disease. Uh, there's various uh, research going on uh, involved in silencing the, uh, the mutant Huntington gene, and so uh, hopeful for therapies and uh, potential cures for that in the future. But this is what the basal ganglia circuitry looks like in a Huntingtonian, uh, Huntington's individual. When, so in this, the substantia nigra is intact. There's no problems with the dopamine, but the dopamine has lost its target. The dorsal striatum, as you can see here with the enlarged ventricles, the striatum uh, on the walls of the ventricle have deteriorated away, and that's why the ventricles get so large. So the dorsal striatum has degenerated. So that process is no longer there. The natural balance uh, within the dorsal striatum as it degenerates is a higher proportion of uh, direct pathway uh, involvement leading to disinhibition of the VA of the thalamus, disinhibition of motor output. So these patients are constantly fighting for control over their motor outputs. Their natural state is constant movement, writhing uncontrolled movement. Uh, so now another condition of the basal ganglia is hemibolism. Hemibolism is similar uh, to Huntington in that it involves large movements, sudden, uncontrolled, involuntary uh, movements. Uh, the thing about these uh, is, is that it's usually unilateral and usually caused by a stroke uh, to a branch of the PCA, one of those perforating branches uh, that supplies, in particular, the subthalamic nucleus. So um, the, the hemibolism is an, also an impairment of the indirect pathway. So let's take a look when the subthalamic nucleus is impaired by a stroke or some other condition. Uh, trauma can cause uh, impairment of the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, for instance, uh, a gun wound, um, an individual decides to kill themselves and, you know, uh, typically, uh, sometimes it's, it's done, they, you know, try to eat the barrel of the gun or whatever. They shoot themselves not through the uh, prosencephalon, they shoot themselves through the brain stem, and, and, you know, that 
will just perhaps nick a portion of the mesencephalon, resulting in damage to the subthalamic nucleus. So uh, these individuals, uh, this is this is uh, uh, this is this happens. Uh, so it's, I'm not just making this up. There are clinical cases that I am personally aware of where uh, this type of thing has occurred. And so the individual then is, uh, you know, doomed for the rest of their life to have uncontrolled motor movement uh, on the ipsilateral side. <clears throat> so um, on the contralateral side, I should say. So, um, uh so the subthalamic nucleus, when that lesion occurs, is no longer stimulating the GPI. So the GPI is only being inhibited. It's never being stimulated. So, it, uh, so motor movement is always disinhibited with a subthalamic nucleus impairment. So there are important concepts, though, about the basal ganglia that we haven't touched on, and that the basal ganglia is involved in a lot more than just motor movement. It's involved in cognitive and executive processes as well as limbic functions. So this whole time we've been talking about the outputs uh, to the VA of the thalamus and the motor cortex. But the, sub, uh, the substantia nigra also projects to uh, the caudate in the dorsal striatum. And through that process involves the dorsomedial nucleus of the thalamus and uh, executive functioning, motivation, in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, the closely related dopaminergic center, VTA, uh, next to, uh, medial to the substantia uh, nigra, projects to the nucleus accumbens for drive and motivation-related functions, as well as the amygdala. Uh, so in that way, uh, projecting to the cingulate gyrus uh, for limbic functions and the, the regulation of emotions. So there can be a plethora of different uh, signs and symptoms in a patient with dopaminergic damage or impairments in portions of the basal ganglia. And so this is important to understand is that your neurodegenerative patients, your elderly patients, your trauma patients might have impairments in functions that you're not regularly thinking about, such as their motivation, their ability to make decisions, to make uh, you know, appropriate and, and uh, healthful decisions, their ability to process their emotions and respond correctly in social situations. So these are important things to think about. Think about your patients in a holistic sense uh, that just because their primary complaint is motor doesn't mean that they're not having other issues that you need to be aware of uh, in order to give them the best care you can give. So, for instance, dopamine, uh, L-dopa, carbidopa given to Parkinsonian patients will stimulate uh, the dopaminergic centers through the VTA as well and cause uh, conditions such as hypersexuality, such as uh, hyperorality, kind of like Kluver-Busey syndromes from uh, excess dopamine from the pharmaceutical they're being given to uh, correct their motor deficits. So these older patients who are taking some of these uh, pharmaceuticals aren't just horn dogs because they're old. It's because there are imbalances and deficits in their neurochemistry and in their circuitry uh, that are related to their condition. And so uh, be aware of this and be prepared to give these patients the best treatment that they deserve uh, because uh, you're there to help them in every capacity, to motivate them, to get them back to normal. Uh, so understand that these conditions are related uh, and you know, not something to be necessarily directly offended about. Uh, be aware that these conditions occur. So anyway, thank you for listening to my lecture on the basal ganglia. I hope you enjoyed it.